All right, so let's just get it started. Hello, everyone. My name is Wu Wen Wang, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science at UC Santa Barbara. Welcome to the Center for Responsible Machine Learning's Distinguished Lecture, AI and Our Future, a conversation with Dr. Kai Fu Lee. Today's event will be hosted in the format of a fireside chat. We would like to thank our event co-sponsors, including UCSB Library, UCSB MailingChimp Mind and Machine Intelligence Initiative, Appfolio, and Amazon Alexa AI team. For today's event, if the audience has any questions, please enter your question in the Q&A tab, and we'll go to your questions towards the end of the talk, uh, if we still have time. Let me introduce today's honorable guest, Dr. Kaifu Lee. Dr. Kaifu Lee has spent more than three decades at the cutting edge research of artificial intelligence, uh, including not just research, but also development and investment. He's the chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a leading venture capital firm. Previously, he was a senior executive at Google, Microsoft, SGI, and Apple. He now co-chairs the Artificial Intelligence Council at the World Economic Forum. He has a bachelor's degree from computer, uh, computer science at Columbia, and also a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Lee is a New York Times best-selling author and the Time 100 most influential. Kai Fu, welcome to UCSB. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Great, um, so uh, we'll just get the conversation started. So um, I read your recent book and um, I became very curious about, you know, how do you uh, develop, right, such an interest in math, engineering, a computer science, <clears throat> and later <throat> on in artificial intelligence. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about your uh, childhood? Uh, yeah, I actually grew up in Tennessee. So it was an uh, interesting environment. And I thought I was extremely good at math and uh, I won the state champion. So I thought, okay, math and follow, see what happens after that, maybe computer science. Uh, but then when I went to Columbia, I found that, you know, the state champion of Tennessee didn't necessarily measure up to some of the really best, best mathematicians, uh, mathematics students at Columbia. So I said, well, if you're going to go into math, you got to be the best and I'm not the best. But then I discovered computer science and, and I thought, uh, and it was really exciting to me, the idea, especially using artificial intelligence, we could uh, understand how we think and make ma think, machines think the way we do. That was just so exciting to me. And also I found that was a lot better at computer science than I was at uh, uh, mathematics. So I switched major into studying computer science. And also I was lucky to have had a couple of great professors from uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, Yale, who joined uh, Columbia faculty, which was a new computer science school, but it decided to uh, hire some faculty in AI. So I got a good exposure to uh, different elements. And uh, I think that was uh, uh, critical to, to my getting started in the AI area. Uh, before we talk about our future, um, I'm very curious about your um, experience in uh, AI research uh, 30 years ago. So in your PhD thesis at CMU in the 80s, you built the CMU Sphinx system, which is the first large vocabulary speaker independent continuous speech recognition system. And what were you thinking back then? Like, have you ever thought about, you know, speech recognition would be so pervasive, it would be everywhere that conversational AI would be um, also uh, this popular today? Um, actually, I chose speech for a very specific reason. Um, I studied natural language and I thought, wow, that was going to be too hard. <laughs> I studied the computer vision and I said, wow, that was going to be too hard. And this, this was in the early 80s, right? And then I thought, okay, speech recognition, that is a lot more well-contained problem. Um, it's, you know, one fewer dimension um, uh, than computer vision and, and transcription to text doesn't imply you have to understand it. Um, and you, you have guidance from a very clear language model 
whereas uh, models guiding computer vision was unclear. This was all, again, back in the 80s. So I said, I'm going to pick an easy problem and then solve it in my PhD thesis. So I was much more optimistic and ambitious. And to a certain extent, I built the best system at the time. And the technologies I developed became the cornerstone for probably the next 25 years in, in computer speech. So that was a success. But it really wasn't good enough. Uh, and I would have thought that someone would have come up with some enhancements that made it good enough, but, but that really didn't happen until people discovered deep learning, and then uh, that became a watershed event that uh, dramatically beat out the other machine learning technologies, and now we're finally reaching maturity and pervasive use of speech. Uh, I, I, I can say I, I knew it was coming, uh, but I didn't know it would take this long. Uh, probably something very similar that reminds me to Elon Musk, people asking him about, you know, when are your robo taxis coming? And he said, well, I know it's coming. I know I'm right, but it's just a matter of a slightly off time frame. So I'll use that too. Um, so I recently read your uh, new book on um, AI 2041. I think it's an excellent book combining uh, some of the existing uh, technologies in AI and also your vision uh, for our future. Um, and also it has a, a sci-fi flavor that I really like. Uh, so for those of uh, the audience who haven't read your new book, can you maybe quickly tell us about your new book? Sure. Um, the, the book I wrote earlier in 2018, AI Superpowers, uh, was a fairly popular book, uh, partly because people saw through it why uh, China was destined to be an AI superpower, but also partly because it helped un people understand what was AI, because AI is not such a mysterious, um, uh, inscrutable, uh, complex thing. It could be explained in plain language. So I thought AI superpowers made us some small contribution there. And I wanted to more people to understand AI because it's such an important technology. And I, I did the best I could with AI superpowers. That's the limit of my writing abilities. So I thought the only way to make it more accessible is to make it entertaining, make it fictional, put stories that people can imagine that they were a part of and put it in context of all the industries and countries in which AI would and could and will make a huge impact. So I found a co-author who is a very well-known science fiction writer in China. Um, and then we worked together. Um, I described the all the about 2025 20, AI technologies and other technologies. Uh, and I described the time frame in which they would are likely to mature. And I described the industries in which they're likely to uh, make a big difference. And then just and then he just went, uh, you know, used his creative powers to put that in context in 10 different countries and made fascinating stories. Um, in some sense, for, for a science fiction writer, he was constrained because uh, we agreed that he would not describe things that would be infeasible in 20 years. So there was no brain-computer interface. There's no teleportation. Uh, things you see a lot in science fiction he could not do. Uh, so he made up for that by uh, uh, creating interesting, dramatic issues and questions and moral dilemma and uh, challenges and problems and um, and even uh, exist, existential threats that made the stories interesting. And then after each of his stories, I would write a commentary that describes the technology, explains in plain language how it works, what are the opportunities, what are the consequences, and how might we reduce the consequences. So that became the AI 2041. Uh, we picked 20 years out because it was long enough to imagine something truly exciting, truly breakthrough. People would open their eyes and say, wow, this is a huge change, but not so long because that would then be pure speculation. So we picked, I think 20 years was a um, reasonable interview, uh, interval and, and hopefully people will uh, enjoy, enjoy reading it. And, and for, I know people here in, at this seminar are mostly computer science uh, experts or students, but uh, I also want anyone who is not to read it uh, and by the end of the book, they will have been entertained by 10 stories, but also, you know, coincidentally learned AI. So if you read the book and like it, uh, I would particularly appreciate it if you would introduce it to people who don't know AI or who misunderstand it. And hopefully it will uh, help them understand it or correct any misunderstanding. Thank you. 
And um, I think uh, there are several um, chapters that's definitely very timely. For example, I remember that a few years ago I was at CMU and I went to uh, Raj Reddy's uh, seminar. And uh, in his seminar, he was talking about, you know, a network of personal guardian angels, right? Which are sort of these virtual avatars uh, talking to each other. Um, and uh, this vision <clears throat> right now, if we look at the uh, recent narratives in metaverse, uh, it does seems like it's very related. And uh, what do you think about the um, AI and AR, VR, are they shaping our future? Uh, yes, but there is a double, uh, you know, this two-edged sword, double-edged sword. So I think I share much more Raj's vision. I think he's such a visionary and I learned so much from him. Uh, and um, I, I think we, we can see um, as an extrapolation, right? Our phone is already an extension of our brain that we rely on Google on the phone or WebMD or Facebook or whatever to find the information or find the people we need to find, but our brain doesn't hold um, all the content that we can remember or we can access or we can discover. So it's already an extension of our brain. So the, the natural next step is for that agent to even know much more about us and uh, be able to work on our behalf and be able to interact with other agents that may represent other people or other agents that may, re may represent apps. So um, if in the future, if a future social network wants my address, well, my, my agent will take care of that, something very mundane, um, but actually something people cannot do. We may have noticed recently, all these websites due to GDPR, they pop up with all these texts that none of us read and we just click OK. It doesn't solve the purpose. Uh, the problem, right, is that people feel their information were being taken and misused. But then the answer of, well, let's ask you each time, that doesn't work because we have either no expertise or we don't know if we can trust the entity um, or we just don't understand it or we don't have the time. So it doesn't solve the problem at all. We really do need an agent to answer uh, uh, the future where we're inundated with these uh, queries, it becomes actually a protector of my personal information. It can also uh, help make decisions, right? Imagine if you know, Amazon wants to show me some products I might buy or, or uh, Expedia wants to show me some trips I want to take. Uh, I don't want to give them all my personal data, uh, but I want them to use knowledge of me to show me things that are relevant. So the agent as an intermediary can do that. And also agents can negotiate on our behalf. If we wanna buy something, barter, negotiate, find the right product, or be on the lookout all the time for the things we want. And also this agent can be a great um, education companion. Uh, uh, young kids, uh, they really would prefer, uh, we actually know this because we've seen apps that do this uh, and, and kids, are much more engaged and learn better if they have an animated cartoon character as their teacher or teaching assistant. Um, and, and, and it's a, a cartoon, uh, maybe a superhero that they, they really like. And also in education, we can take all the content and put it in the domain that excites each individual kid. Um, like someone who loves basketball can have questions math questions converted to basketball questions. So I think all these take all the AI power, the power to target, personalize, um, that could be misused if all the data and power were given to large internet companies. But if we had a little guardian angel that knows us, it can give us what we want, get, protect our information, uh, save us a lot of time. So I very much believe uh, that particular path. That is not quite metaverse. That is uh, still in this world. Uh, it's kind of a, the next natural step for the phone to evolve into. Uh, I'm also a big fan of AR, VR, and, and um, um, metaverse, and I talk about it in the book. Uh, but, but my thoughts, I think I would, um, I agree with all the things that um, people are excited about and are working on, but I would uh, put a few words of caution because I did work on the space actually in the uh, mid nineties uh, at SGI. This was where this all began, right? The, um, the, the, that, we, that SGI machines were used to create Toy Story and the animation, the Terminator. 
opened our eyes to the future possibilities and we started exploring. We learned a couple of things uh, at SGI, but also uh, repeatedly um, as VR had their hype cycles. First is that this immersive world is incredibly hard to build. Uh, because we needed to be photorealistic, engaging, entertaining, and different and customized. It, the, the authoring is incredibly hard. Secondly, we really haven't found any killer apps other than entertainment. Now, entertainment is huge. Movies, games is huge. But I see many people moving into, jumping to the conclusion that we will socialize and have a culture in this space. Well, I actually believe that, but I don't think it's as easy to develop because people have tried for years. You know, at SGI and later at Microsoft, uh, executives were thinking, well, if we had a 3D space, we could do business negotiations and then visualize all the data and, and use it for social. It, none of that ever happened. Uh, it may happen, it's likely to happen in the future, but not without first using entertainment as the first killer app in which uh, good business will, will succeed and people have great experiences. So I, uh, the second cause, so, so content is hard. Um, se secondly, entertainment is the only known killer app and then others can be built later. Uh, and, and, and third, I think we have to be careful uh, once this succeed, even at the entertainment level, that removing people from this world and putting them in metaverse is incredibly dangerous to do because who's most likely to be addicted? People who are not happy in this world and then they find happiness in that world. Then they disengage and they may totally turn into these uh, you know, uh, uh, people in, in Wall-E that uh, have and disengage from this world. Disengagement from this world is not, not a good thing. We need more people to connect to people. One of our unique aspects of people is that we are personable. We like people, we trust people, we make friends, um, and, and we remove that and everything's in the metaverse. That is not something uh, that is natural or good for people. So ha have to be careful about that. And then lastly, there are just some near-term technological challenges about building a lightweight enough uh, glasses that are socially acceptable, lightweight enough, easy to use, um, not make the great majority of us dizzy uh, and photorealistic and bright enough. And all of those things will take time, probably uh, five to 10 years, uh, we could have a good experience, but that one is likely to be entertainment first and then other things build on top. So that would be how I envision uh, metaverse will em emerge, uh, not just by Mark declaring it so. Thank you. Thank you, Kai Fu. I certainly share uh, the same feeling that I think there are these perils of uh, AI systems. And meanwhile, there's also a lot of opportunities ahead of us. And uh, when, I, when I was reading your book, I also feel like the same thing that um, AI systems, they are reaching certain accuracy. They are doing extremely well in certain applications. But I think um, in the academia and also in the industry, there are more and more concerns about the transparency explainability, fairness, and like you mentioned, privacy issues with AI systems. And I think as academic, we struggle a lot uh, to define um, and agree over those concepts. What do they exactly mean? And how do we incorporate them uh, in the objective functions when we're building these AI systems? So i um, wondering what's your take uh, over these issues? Well, I'm very pleased that uh, you uh, are represent um, the Center for Responsible Machine Learning, and this this seminar is is uh, sponsored by such a center. I think having the word responsible is the most important first step, because I think people who are in AI as researchers and engineers uh, need to know that they wield uh, phenomenal power, and with great power comes great responsibility. So just like doctors have to swear the Hippocrates oath when they uh, begin to practice. I think the AI engineers need to know that they may end up causing harm to people or causing unfairness or causing uh, unhappiness in people with the algorithms that they program, that they're not just achieving a high accuracy or help make some economic result happen, but they really uh, carry great responsibility. So I think that's the first step is the education. Um, and then I think there will be a role for regulation, uh, but I think the current reliance on regulation is excessive. 
Uh, I think EU is um, habitually excessive with regulation. They deal with everything by fining this company and, and the Department of Justice in the U.S. breaking up companies. These are the wrong tools. This is, you know, uh, using using the wrong tool to uh, to, to 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 fix a problem. Um, you know, you're you're get the, the patient the patient has a cold and you want surgery. That's not the right thing. I, I think uh, regulations can uh, do things like. Um, you know, potentially severe punishment for people who compromise your data intentfully. Uh, you know, the fact that Cambridge Analytica got away and their CEO founded another company means that the regulators aren't doing the most obvious and needed thing that needed to be done. So I think that kind of regulation is needed. Um, and, and clearly some of the others are needed too. But, but I think, you know, um, breaking up companies and finding them does not solve the problem. So how, how do we solve the problem? I believe technologists will play a big role in solving the problem. Uh, we don't, none of us know what the exact right answers are, but we can sort of point the way, right? Explainability, you know, if we try to take a machine learning decision and do our best to explain in a humanly understandable language that is uh, true to what the true decision was made, but not complete because you can never completely explain a fancy, a complex math formula. Um, and also don't hold the bar too high. Um, if you hold the bar to be perfectly explain yourself, we'll never succeed. If we hold the bar to better than the way humans explain themselves, then I think we could succeed. So, that, so that's, um, I think, a combination of changing our um, too high standards and metrics, and also at the same time doing research to meet reasonable metrics. In the case of um, uh, bias, I think I think tools can be built that uh, predict and uh, and uh, warn the possibility of uh, insufficient data for 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 um, a gender or a race or or particular categories. So yes, the engineers need to be responsible, but the tool can help a lot, just like compilers give us warnings. Um, so AI tools can give us warnings too. And then on uh, finally on uh, personal data protection. So technologies related to the new field, privacy computing, technologies like uh, federated learning, um, uh, homomorphic encryptions and uh, uh, trusted execution hardware environments, these are all worth uh, pursuing. I, I think some combination of technology with, with the right regulation uh, will, will keep the problems of technology in check. And, and I have this confidence because uh, with every new technology, especially breakthrough technology, uh, they always come with um, unexpected serious consequences and problems. And ultimately, technology plus some regulations save the day. Think about electricity. Um, people got electrocuted in their homes when the electricity connected there. And then people invented um, circuit breakers. And think about PC and the internet. When they were first connected, viruses spread all over the place. Uh, but people invented antivirus software. So we, we need to have faith and we need, need to also devote um, time, right? As, as faculty and management at your university, um, not all of your faculty and students should be thinking about advancing you know, deep learning and, and making applications work better, making theory works better. Some of the faculty and their projects ought to work on these problems that solve the technological problems so that we can pave a road so that more technologies can be deployed so as to not get into the case that more and more people are alarmed by AI. More than half the people in the U.S., feel negatively about AI today. And that's way up over five years ago. And I, I think we need to, on the one hand, um, like my book, try to explain AI can do a lot more good uh, than bad. But on the other hand, also start inventing technologies that work hand in hand with regulations that contain the problems that technologies may bring. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I know that uh, the ACM Association for Computing Machinery, they started to look at, you know, regulating AI uh, for autonomous weapon. Um, and then uh, there are also concerns uh, that, you know, regulation is indeed a double edged sword uh, that we don't want every single AI algorithm to be, uh, you know, regulated 
regardless of the application, regardless of the context. Um, so definitely hear you. Uh, you also mentioned deep learning and deep learning uh, indeed has disrupted many AI applications uh, in the last five years. Um, but can you think about any directions uh, that are unpopular today, but it could be uh, potentially uh, popular in the future? Well, I think every unpopular idea has, has a chance, right? Back, uh, back when I did my thesis on speech recognition, uh, Jan LeCun was working at Bell Labs and, and his approach did not get good results. And, and actually many of his papers were not accepted. But later on we learned it's not that his methods are bad, his methods are better than mine, than anyone else's. It's just that he was before his time. His methods needed a lot more computation and data and we didn't have it at the time. So, so with lessons like that, I think we all need to uh, remain open-minded, uh, whether it's for, um, you know, um, going back to classical AI, combining them with machine learning, uh, or uh, take, take deep learning and, and machine learning technologies further uh, in you know, capsule and other, other approaches that are being, being proposed. Uh, and, and also, uh, or I think they're the, the, you know, the, the currently dominant school that says just, just throw more data and, and compute power, uh, that might be another approach. And, uh, and also there are, um, you know, neurally in, um, inspired um, neuromatic computing types of algorithms, studying combinations of uh, brain science and, 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 and also quantum and quantum inspired algorithms. I think all of them uh, should be pursued. The whole point of university and scientific exploration is that uh, you should not be bound by commercial viability or historical success or failure. Uh, and and I think I think we need people who will single-mindedly uh, pursue uh, research technology areas. And and I think you know I'm probably today too tainted by the fact that I make investments that have a 10-year horizon to uh, to to become a public company. Um, so that if I actually provide judgment, um, this is technology good or bad. It's it's actually the opposite of the whole idea of academia being free. Uh, having freedom from the industry to pursue things that are unpopular before it's time. So I would hesitate to, to, to name anything, uh, partly because I'm humbled by what has happened, but partly because I think our whole system is designed so that researchers uh, should have the freedom uh, to be uh, influenced by uh, uh, investors like us. Um, there's the other question I've been uh, very curious um, in my um, perseverance and research is that uh, when we're looking at, you know, for example, your CSIS, um, HMM approaches or statistical approaches in AI, um, they allowed us to learn from, you know, allow machines to learn from past experiences, and then uh, they can process the frequent, uh, the majority of the queries really well. But uh, what about the long tail, uh, the minority or the infrequent uh, input to AI systems? So I guess the question is, does AI serve the majority or does AI serve the minority? Um, well, by definition, uh, most statistical approaches will strongly um, bias things that are frequent. And that's the magic to making uh, you know, speech recognition work. You know, back when I did my thesis, our phonetic recognition was in the, uh, you know, 60% or so. Yet we could produce word accuracy of, uh, you know, 97% because we apply very strong semantic uh, constraint in the language model. So, um, so by definition, that's the way the system would work. Um, but I also think new approaches like the recent, uh, large language models and self-supervised learning uh, that can potentially you know, train on everything under the, uh, the sun, all the text in the world, and, and be fine-tuned for a specific task or based on a specific uh, point you make, it can be smart about uh, selective looking at previous contexts, and that may allow it to find some long-tail um, uh, uh, content 
Just like if you try GPT-3 and you said something truly esoteric, long tail, it's still likely to be able to say something meaningful because it, it, it will have found it because of the huge language model it has. So that's um, a possible direction uh, that I think if we, if we continue to go with these uh, outsized uh, language models, uh, they, they will cover cater long tail better. And I think that's one of, one of their power. Um, the, the other comment I would make is that uh, I personally think uh, AGI is extremely hard. Uh, and if we and replicating ourselves is extremely hard, but it's very clear that AI will improve in its ability to copy us. Uh, the, the fact that you know the Turing tests need will need to be continually upgraded, uh, so because we can hardly tell whether it's a computer or a human, partly because it's able to handle the long tail and also build a powerful you know, imagery, video, lip syncing, as well as the speech and the language. So, so the interesting question is, uh, as com computers attempt to copy us towards this future goal of AGI, but in the meantime, just try to pass higher and higher stricter Turing tests, uh, it really can't afford a long tail error. Because if you look at uh, let's sit, again stick with GPT-3. If you look at the, its errors, its errors are horrendous, right? If you ask it, when did Bill Gates intern at Apple? It would tell, it would fabricate some, some answer. It's horrible at, at that. It, it's a long, long tail uh, content. So, so I think when you try to really um, anthropomorphize or copy human being, you can't even afford a tiny mistake. Imagine, imagine a scenario like her. Right, someone is dating a virtual uh, uh, agent or whatever uh, avatar, uh, and and we can probably make very reasonable conversation to uh, keep the person um, uh, company, maybe become a friend, maybe even fall in love one day. But but imagine if that person fell in love, and one day the uh, the avatar says something totally out of the blue, ridiculous, no human would ever say, which is very possible right now, uh, that that whole Turing test will, will fall apart. So this increasingly less likely, but continuously highly uh, nonsensical error, I think will prevent us from building things that are highly realistic Turing tests um, uh, passing. And, and that would have strong implications also in metaverse, right? If we're going to create a world in which many of the pe people you interact with are not people, then they better not make any fatal, ridiculous um, conversation or uh, right now. And, and, and I think today the problem is that these virtual conversations are getting better and better, but when they fail, they fail catastrophically. So it is an issue we need to deal with. Yes, and um, in our earlier conversation, you mentioned uh, human users and you also mentioned engineers uh, driving the innovation. So um, there is this growing um, you know, um, understanding that there are uh, mutual in impacts between engineers and scientists who are designing and driving the innovation, but also human users, they're adapting um, and also in generating in uh, inputs uh, to uh, uh, the uh, innovation of these products um, using AI. So you work in AI in multiple roles in academia, in industry, and now you're a venture capitalist. <clears throat> Can you tell us who is driving the AI innovations? Are users driving the innovations or are scientists, engineers, and developers driving the AI innovations? Um, I think everyone is working together towards that. Uh, the, I think the engineers and the entrepreneurs are looking for opportunities that are commercially exciting and meaningful to users. And then users are using it, giving their feedback. And then researchers are finding new ways uh, to solve problems. Uh, so I, th I, and then academia is um, uh, working at, on the problems that the applications reveal, but more importantly, working on the, um, the re research paths that they think are most important. I think we have a good ecosystem in which they work together. The example I like the best is, uh, I know this uh, Amazon Alexa is one of our 
uh, sponsors. So I'll do a little advertising for them. I'm extremely impressed by what they have done. Obviously, there are many companies do it now, but you know, because I worked in the field of speech recognition, and most people think of it as how to reduce the error rate and what is the killer app. Um, th there are two things that they ignored that the Amazon Alexa team was at least among the first to discover. The first is that uh, for speech to be a useful modality, uh, it's, you, you need a speech first um, uh, product in which to put it. Uh, on the PC, it's impossible to make it speech first because it's obviously keyboard and mouse first. On the phone, uh, it may have been possible 20 years ago, but not anymore because it's a multi-touch first. So speech will just be a fifth wheel. And, and, and in those scenarios, it will never gain developer adoption. So you need to be bold and create a new device. So I think that is a phenomenal realization that typical speech researchers in, in the lab won't think of. Um, uh, at least even if they think of it, they won't have the ability to create a, a, a new product like Alexa. That's the first realization. The second um, is once you decide such a thing will be a smart speaker, then you realize the problem is not in speech recognition error rate, it's in um, resistance to noise and specifically noise in the living room, uh, the, the speaker playing, the dog barking, the TV playing, and you need to know who's speaking and you need to have a mechanism to wake up Alexa. And, and then you have to you know, deal with all the issues like not sending all the speech and storing it uh, remotely because it, it hurts privacy and you have to wake up and you have to build hardware and the microphone array. So then you solve the real engineering problem. So that is, I think, a good example where, uh, where thinking about users and application and scenario in, in a forward looking way and solving the right problems ends up building a great product. In that case, not requiring new um, fundamental AI research, uh, but there are, but so, so I think that's a good model for people working on uh, products to, to think about. Thank you. And um, uh, speaking in your um, uh, venture capitalist uh, career uh, over the last decade, and uh, we're very curious about your mental models uh, on selecting uh, this winning companies. And, um, you know, when you go through this multiple cycles, investing in AI, um, you know, have it, has it changed, right? So how do you select um, these winning companies uh, when you're going through these uh, cycles? Uh, yeah, well, we, we obviously do a lot of things, um, but among, among them is, I think we read a lot of papers and try to see what area is tipping. So to put it in sim simpler terms, you know, we know this about um, eight years ago when computer vision was tipping. It was the time when Jeff Hinton sent his students to Microsoft, Facebook, um, and, um, uh, and Google and demonstrated that deep learning worked better than the traditional technologies they were using. And, and then that accelerated and eventually beat human performance. And that opened up all the applications in medical manufacturing, autonomous vehicles, and so on. So, so we saw that. Uh, so we read the papers and we followed Jeff's work and his students' work. And the, 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 the change in attitude at Microsoft, Google, and, and, and Facebook. And we said, okay, it's time for look for companies to look for people who understand deep learning. And, and that was um, uh, one, one way in which we... Um, bet on computer vision. We bet on probably 15 companies that relate to computer vision one way or another, if you count autonomous vehicles. And that represented our best returns because we saw this early. And I think we are seeing that again today with self-supervised models uh, and, and the, its use in natural language, but also beyond in, in multimodality, in mixed uh, um, video, image, and language, in also medical in potentially applying it to protein folding and beyond and, and to genetic sequencing. So we are now, again, very actively looking for how self-supervised models trained on a huge amount of data uh, can open up and solve um, big problems because we now see it beating people on um, problems that previously looked really, looked really hard, like reading comprehension. So uh, we're very excited about, about that. So that's probably the a single way in which we are closest to, to research community. Uh, we need to stay close, uh, read the papers, 
uh, check the breakthroughs um, and and also um, and and also have a um, apply our experience on how long it takes a research breakthrough to become a commercial success. I hear you, and um, that brings us to the uh, next question that is uh, very related to what you just said. Um, I think in your book. Um, you talk about the future of uh, human AI coexistence. Um, and, um, you know, like you mentioned, there are already some differences in performance between human and machine uh, in different tasks. So what are the unique advantages of humans? Um, I, I think there are still two big areas, um, maybe two and a half areas in which uh, AI still falls way short. Uh, first is really people's ability to conceptualize and um, analyze things, think strategically, think cross-domain, um, creativity, uh, but also common sense. Uh, these are things that uh, uh, we don't know how to do AI. We're beginning to see maybe some glimpse of hope in the self-supervised models, but we're clearly not, not there yet. So that's one, one area. Um, the second area is really the human-human connection. And, and that is um, our compassion, empathy, uh, our communication, team, teamwork, uh, how we gain and earn and, and keep the respect and trust of each other, uh, our consciousness, self-awareness. Um, and uh, these are things we really don't know how they correlate to our you know, brain waves, uh, nor do we... Uh, know how to embed them into software. And perhaps it is something that we should maintain as, as human. And, and also we have a high threshold, even if AI copied some of that, uh, once they mess up, we will uh, you know, uh, write them off. So I think that's the second area where it's um, uh, important, where, where we're unique. And then the third is aspects of dexterity, right? Our hand-eye coordination, how we can build art and craft in very uh, special ways. Uh, the fact that AI has not been able to uh, take over some of the uh, even assembly line work that requires our hand-eye skills and our dexterity. Um, th this will happen eventually, but it will take a lot of time because uh, robotics and mechanical engineering uh, doesn't quite move up and improve at the same speed as uh, software and machine learning algorithms. So that's the two and a half areas. So if I were advising a young person about what skills to hone, these I think are the most important skills uh, that uh, because other skills that are more quantitative, uh, repetitive, optimizing, uh, we'll never be able to be beat AI algorithms, especially as they improve. So we're better off honing things that AI cannot do. And then we can become uh, symbiotic and complementary to AI. We can do what we do best. Uh, they do what they do best. And uh, one of our audience asked a very related question. They pointed out that I think comparing to uh, comparing machines and human, children can do one shot learning, right? They can look at one example, they learn the lesson, sure. um, you know, one or two examples. Whereas for machines, uh, still for pre training or fine tuning, we need a lot more examples. So what will it take uh, for, you know, one shot learning to get to AI? I don't know. You guys are the researchers. You tell me. Uh, but but I, I, I would say I would not view that as a pure shortcoming um, because, because if AI doesn't yet work well with one shot training, one, one learning, one answer is, well, let's just fetch so much data. Let's just use the quantities of data to make AI shine. That is kind of the proven formula. So that's the dumb way. And of course, you know, one shot learning itself has been improving over, over the past decade. So people should continue, continue to work on that. Um, and and maybe, maybe it is a combination of um, a very futuristic advanced self uh, supervised model that is very large. Maybe, you know, one shot learning is fundamentally hard for today's database learning methods, but maybe you train it on so much um, existing uh, data that are somewhat relevant, then, then you build using transfer learning or fine tuning on top of that, 
um, one child learning is good enough because you have this pre-trained model. It's not that different. The analogy in human is, you know, our childhood, in our childhood, we learn language. Then on top of that language, uh, you know, learning, one child learning can work. So, so what is the future correlate of the human language learning, common sense learning process that we could teach a self-supervised model so that on top of which one child learning might work? Thank you. And um, there's also a question from the uh, audience who is very uh, curious about, you know, your experience um, about, you know, managing a research organization in the industry comparing to what you're doing mm -hmm. now as ma managing a venture capital uh, company. So um, how do you set the uh, uh, visions and goals uh, for this kind of organizations? Uh, what are the differences uh, when you're managing, um, you know, these organizations uh, in AI? Yeah, um, uh, I think one of the key challenges of uh, management or leadership is to understand the different constituents and, and, and try to align their interests in, in the direction that, that people can support. And then when the interests are not clearly alignable, uh, try to be a good middle person explaining it. So in the case of managing a research lab in the industry, uh, the challenge clearly is that the product groups are gonna view you as ivory tower. Uh, why are we making all the money for the company and you get this high salary stock options and you don't contribute anything. And then the researchers who feel, well, we've been promised we could uh, do world-class research and publish papers. So we're doing that. You guys are just kind of, you know, um, engineers who build products. Anybody could do that. We do the advanced work. So I think this is the fundamental challenge and conflict is how do we find a way to communicate to the product groups and often the CEO that the research we work is forward-looking and basically creating a lighthouse effect to uh, give the company a direction to move towards that it's a visionary uh, thought leading and future, in the future useful and with openness to work with product groups. And then with the researchers, I think it's uh, giving them the space to, to explore and the freedom, but also finding uh, opportunities to align. That I think is probably the biggest uh, success factor. If you look at the rise and fall of the various uh, research labs, uh, they have uh, typically gone too far. Either they become slaves to the product groups and then the researchers get fed up and leave, uh, or they uh, maintain their aloof presence in the ivory tower and then the company goes in through a let downturn and shuts them down. So managing that, um, aligning that interest in two groups who are not naturally aligned is the tough issue. Uh, the same thing is true with, with venture capital. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the entrepreneurs, you know, want, want to change the world. The LPs want to make money. They both want to safely get their capital back and make a big multiple. And then um, we have to basically balance that um, and, and also um, uh, uh, so, so we have to basically come up with an investment approach and manage our efforts so that they stay aware on what's happening in technology, but not get carried away with uh, doing technology for technology's sake and being very um, realistic on, on, on dates and the market and revenue and things like that. So, you know, I think the versatility is another element of um, success in, in, in leadership that you cannot just be one style, you need to um, you need to uh, have multiple skill sets and apply the right one at the right time. So, you know, I hate to be a bean counter, right? But if we have a company that's not making its numbers, that's what I'm going to have to do, right? And sometimes as a VC, uh, I need to be a, a cheerleader for the entrepreneur, let's say. I need to be a cheerleader. I need to uh, become their promoter. I need to... Um, cheer them up when they are down. Um, and I need to um, pu push them into more discipline when they're potentially in trouble. I need to alert them when I've seen many cases that they're falling into the same trap and they need to change their approach. And, and the, probably the most difficult part is that entrepreneurs are extremely different from employees. So when I managed PhDs and engineers and marketing and sales, 
uh, there's KPIs and people know what they got to do. It's a very clear social contract. Um, the manager with negotiation gives you a direction, you go for it, you make it, you get a promotion, you get a raise. It's a fairly simple system. With entrepreneurs, it's quite different. Entrepreneurs, uh, the best entrepreneurs, if you think about who are the best entrepreneurs, right? Uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk. These are people who are independent minded. They think they know a lot more than you do, the VC, and they don't, they, they are offended if you act like a teacher to them or, or give them directions or give them KPIs. So, so the way to influence an entrepreneur is often by just sharing your thoughts um, without giving specific um, things to do. And, 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 and we learned probably the most important skill set working with entrepreneurs is to um, um, figure out what to say in a conversation and, 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 and nudge them to learn about certain things and to consider other things like, have you studied this company in the US? Have you studied this particular uh, other industry? And, and just nudge them a little bit and, and give them some food for thought and, and hope that the thing you know they must do, one day they'll come to you and said, I thought of the most brilliant thing I need to do. It is this, and it's actually my idea, but I didn't tell it to them. They found it out on their own because for an entrepreneur, only when the idea is his or her own, will they pursue it with passion and dedication. When they're told by a VC, their first response is, who are you? You know my job or do I know my job? Secondly, um, I want money from you. I'll come to you, don't come to me. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I don't need to listen. I'm in control of my company. Um, and, and so I think the learning the skill set to get them to realize to what to realize and think it's their own idea is probably the most valuable tool uh, that a VC could have. Thank you. Thank you for sharing experience. Uh, one last question uh, for today's uh, session. Um, you know, as professors and educators, we often struggle, you know, what kind of long-term suggestions, long-term advice we would want to give our college students. So now this year is 2021, and what kind of advice, right, would you like to give to our college students? How should they be prepared for 2041 uh, to stay competitive? Yeah, so the first is the two and a half areas, right? The uh, are the areas to develop. And, and road learning won't get you there anymore. Uh, think about college as a period in which you learn how to learn, as opposed to you learn some skill set. Because any road learning, AI can do better. And, but why, by learning how to learn, as new technologies and knowledge is invented, you'll be able to grab them. So, so, so spend, spend time focused on uh, the soft skills, uh, continue to learn new things, but also take a step back and think whether you've learned how to learn, whether as a new technology comes down, can you learn that on your own? Do you, or do you still need a course and a professor? And the answer needs to be yes. And also I think it's important to follow your heart, follow your passion, because in an increasingly competitive world, if you are doing what you love, then you'll be thinking about it when you're uh, taking a shower, sleeping and eating, and that will put you further ahead. In a world where not only are you competing with other humans, you're competing with AI, uh, you need to particularly do what you love so that your uh, capabilities can, can, can come through. And, and lastly, be very adaptive and be very willing to let go. Uh, 50 years ago, people could have one job for the whole life. And today, is probably five to seven jobs just because of um, uh, the changes in technology, changes in the industry, um, and also elimination of jobs um, and, and changing of definition of jobs. So we need to always be willing to adapt. Don't, don't assume your whole life for your whole life, you can just do one thing, um, but, but rather um, uh, be, be willing when the right time comes, be more bold to, uh, to take a chance because uh, the younger you are, the, the lower the cost of taking a chance, right? If you are 40 years old and you take a chance and leave your executive job and go to another industry, it's very risky. But when you're 
2025, uh, the think that the downside is is a minimal, and the upside can be phenomenal if you're able to gain as you explore new areas. So be bold, uh, make decisions that um, may be somewhat risky, but calculate the risk, but don't be bold and and take the steps that that you think are good for you and that are you're passionate about and and don't look back. And if 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 all of your steps you take um, led to uh, disappointment or even failure, uh, remember that uh, people learn the most from their failures, and 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 that it's a good lesson and will prepare you well for the future. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lee. And I think we're right at the hour mark. I want to thank Dr. Lee again for this very engaging conversation with us. Please read his new book, AI 2041, uh, 10 Visions for Our Future. And also want to thank today's uh, co-sponsors for the event and you audience for joining us uh, for this uh, fireside chat. So thanks everyone and hope to see you in the next event. Thanks, bye-bye.